Good morning, River Church. How are y'all doing this morning? Good, good. Good morning. My name is Daniela. I just have a few quick announcements before we carry on with today's service. Welcome to our first Sunday of Advent. Um, hope you are feeling in the spirit, in the Christmas spirit. It looks, everything looks like it's ready for Christmas, and so we are too. Um, we are so glad to be with you this morning. If this is your first time, welcome. We are so glad that you decided to join us this morning. I just have a few quick announcements for you. You should have received a welcome card. Looks like this, it's called a connection card. On this card, we would love to get some information from you, um, have a way to follow up with you after your time here. We also have a special gift for you. So if you will fill this out and take it over to the welcome table over there in the back, we would love to give you a special gift. Pastor Andy and his wife Lydia will be there and they would love to personally welcome you to River um, and give you that special gift. So for everyone else, your connection card is a way for you to write a prayer request, tell us what's going on. The leaders of this church would love to know how to specifically pray for you. So if you will take this card and write your requests on the back, you can drop it in the offering container as it goes by later on. Um, another thing, this month we are actually not doing our prayer gathering and our community night. So for the month of December, just just so you know, if you are regularly attending those events, we won't have them this month. Um, but one thing that you can plan for that's outside of the regularly scheduled programming is our Christmas Eve service. So save the date. Um, Christmas Eve, as you guys are figuring out what your plans are for um, the holidays, if you will mark your calendar for our Christmas Eve service that Friday, Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. So that is all that I have. Um, let me pray for us before we carry on with today's service. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for this first Sunday of Advent, Lord. Um, we just thank you for, for where you've brought us as a church, where you're taking us, Lord, for bringing us to this season and still being able to gather together. Um, Lord, I, I just thank you for the way that you've blessed this church, Lord. I thank you um, for these beautiful people. Um, Lord, I pray that as we journey through this month that we would learn from you in a new way as we study your word, as we study um, the Christmas story, Lord, that we would just know you better and, and come to understand Christmas even more. Lord, um, thank you so much for this Sunday, and I pray that you would um, be with Pastor Andy as he leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and Merry Christmas. It's finally the time of year where I can say that and with no, uh, with no apologies. It's not too early, right? You can now officially listen to Christmas music. You can now officially say Merry Christmas. Uh, we are in the season. Thanksgiving is behind us. I don't know what you did the last few days. I don't know what you did the last few days, uh, but I hope you had uh, some time to relax. I spent a few days... Uh, after eating turkey and enjoying my family, I've, I've spent a few days uh, watching uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Beatles documentary, Get Back, that just dropped, um, on, or dropped on Thanksgiving Day. So if you have Disney Plus, I, I, you, know, you can watch that. It's not necessarily entertaining, but it's really, really good. So if you're a Beatles fan, you can watch that. I spent well, you, Good Friday, maybe you were uh, indulging in the, 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 the mess of the mall and all that. I was in... Uh, I was in a duck blind, having a really good duck hunt on, on Good Friday. Uh, did I say Good Friday? Black Friday. Uh, and uh, before you spend all your money uh, on, on uh, extravagant gifts, which I, I do encourage, I encourage generosity this time of year towards your kids and your spouse and your friends and your loved ones, I encourage that. Uh, but I also encourage you to, to, to make good on your commitments to be generous toward the church. Um, this time of year, I, I encourage you every year, uh, as, as Lydia and I uh, also attempt to give our, our best, our most extravagant gift to God. Uh, and the way that we as Christ followers give to God, we don't airmail it to heaven. We give it to the local ministry, the, the, the church. And so I encourage you to make good on it. Many of you s said, you know, for the rest of the year, I'm going to, going to give extravagantly uh, sacrificially to River Church. So just encourage you to be, make good on your promises. We're coming to the end of another month here, and we've got financial needs that, 
that we want to meet well here at River Church. So keep that in mind as you budget your money for December and you plan to, uh, to buy those special gifts. Do that. Do that. But also I encourage you to give generously to the church. So it is Christmas time, and so we have Billy, Pastor Billy and I are going to be preaching through this new sermon series called A Thrill of Hope, The Weary World Rejoices. I love that phrase. Um, we could preach this theme every Christmas. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. This is the story of Jesus. This is this is a good way of encapsulating the story of how Jesus and why Jesus came to the earth as a baby, ultimately to die on the cross. So we're going to take we're going to take words for the next four weeks: uh, thrill, hope, weariness, and rejoicing. Today we're talking about thrill, but the thrill, the hope, the weariness, and the rejoicing that are all a part of the Christmas season, and they're all a part of the story of Jesus. So that's where we're going to, where we're going to be headed over the next four weeks uh, during this Advent season. More specifically, if you go to the next slide, we're going to be looking at the Christmas hymns or songs in Luke chapter 1 and 2. You, you may or you may not know that we have four songs recorded by Luke, the author of the, the second book in the New Testament, the second of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Well, in the book of Luke, uh, he records four hymns or songs. If you, if you look in Luke chapter 1 and 2, you'll notice that you've got, you've got prose, you've got, you've got the, the writing, in our, in our English Bible, and it's laid out in prose. It just goes uh, in paragraph form. But then you'll get to a section, and it's laid out in a, in a poetic fashion. So the spacing and the indentation in our English Bible, it looks, it looks different. It looks like, like a little poem. And there are at least four. There are actually more than that. But there are at least four of those little sections in most of your English translations, probably all of them. And there are these four hymns. Now, now I, I wonder, and, and honestly, no one knows for sure, uh, were they actually sung? Uh, you know, originally, were they sung? Did Mary break out in song? Is, is Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2 like a, like a musical that you might watch, you know, watch on TV? Well, well maybe, maybe. Um, we have four hymns. The first one we're talking about today, it's, it's, it's the Magnificat. And, and by the way, if you, if you grew up uh, in, in a Catholic setting, in a Catholic church, then these hymns, the, the Magnificat, the Benedictus, the Gloria, and the Nuc Dimittis, they're a part of uh, the, or the original, the, the Latin Mass that came out of the, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin Bible. And so they've been a part of church history for 2,000 years or 1,500 years at least. But we have these four hymns, these four songs. And it's what, what, what seems, it, it seems to me that, that, that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that, that at these high, uh, highly emotional moments in, in, in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, that Mary and then Zechariah, the, the, the father of John the Baptist, and then, and then the angels who, who sang to the, um, the shepherds, and then finally Simeon, this old prophet. They, it, it seems to me that, that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they just, they just, they just belted out this, this, this wonderful, poetic, prophetic utterance that the church has grabbed a hold of and made into the songs of the church for the last 1,500 years. So, so did Mary sing the Magnificat? Maybe. Did Mary speak this beautiful poetic uh, utterance that ultimately the church kept, uh, used as a song? May maybe. 
But I do believe these are the actual words that, that Mary sang or, or, or spoke. And we've, got little, we've got pictures, not photos. We've got pictures of Mary who, who sang or spoke the Magnificat, this magnificent song, and then go through those. And then we've got um, week two. Next week, we have the song of Zechariah. He is the father of John the Baptist, and he's overcome with emotion because he is certain that he and his wife Elizabeth will never have children because they're they're old, they're beyond childbearing years, and then and then an angel comes and tells him that that no, in fact, Elizabeth is going to have a baby, and so he's over overwhelmed and he sings or speaks this this song, the. Um, the Benedictus, and then the, the week three, we have the angels singing or speaking. In this case, it really does seem like they, they're, they're singing to the shepherds, the Gloria, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. And then week four, we have the final song in Luke chapter two. And it is the nunc dimittis, which is Latin for now let thou thy servant go in peace. And basically what Simeon, this, 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 this old uh, faithful man who worked in the church for decades, what he's saying is, I have been waiting for the Christ child to be born. Now I'm holding the Christ child in my hand. Let, let your servant now depart in peace. In other words, I'm good. I'm, I can die now. I've seen the Messiah, the Christ child. I'm holding the little baby. This prophetic event has now taken place. I'm good. Now let me die in peace. So those are the four songs that we're going to be looking at, the four hymns of Luke chapter 1 and 2. If you, if you care to know, um, when, you, when you study the original Greek, it doesn't say that they sang them. Even in, even in the, uh, the case of the angels, it says that they, they spoke or they shouted or they cried aloud. It, you know, in, each, in each of the stories, the, the verb isn't sung, so I don't know if they sang them or not. I like to think that they did perhaps sing them. Anyway, that's where we're headed today. And over the next three weeks, and week one, we're going to be talking about Mary. Let me give you a little backstory before we jump into the passage. It's been a year since you've really thought much about Mary and the birth of Jesus, and so uh, this may or, may or may not be new info for you, but it's worth, it's worth remembering. Um, the backstory, before we ever get to Mary singing uh, the Magnificat, is that she is a young, <clears throat> teenage, single, and yet betrothed, sort of like being engaged, young, single, betrothed lady. And uh, she is, uh, she's going about her business, uh, doing her thing, uh, whatever a, a young, poor seemingly insignificant lady does in her day. And all of a sudden she's met with, <clears throat> um, she's confronted with the angel, the angel Gabriel, and he says to her, says, um, you're, now, you're now an important person. Yeah. Blessed are, are you. We'll look at the passage later. And, and she, she uh, doesn't know what to do with that. She, I mean, again, she's a young, poor, single lady in a culture where very few people even know her name. I mean that literally, and I also mean that figuratively. Uh, and, and, then, and then she... Uh, has some time to, to ponder and consider what that might mean, what the angel has said to her. And then she travels to see her, um, 
we, we often say cousin. We don't really know that from, from the original language. What we know is that they were kinswomen or they were relatives in some fashion. That's really all we know from the, from the text. They were, they were relatives. So Mary goes to see Elizabeth, her relative. And, and when she sees Elizabeth, who, who is the mother of John the Baptist, so John the Baptist and Jesus are related, maybe cousins or second cousins or something like that. Um, so, so Mary is with child. She is carrying the Christ child. And Elizabeth is with child. She is carrying John the Baptist. And when they, when they meet, when they come together, the baby in Elizabeth, John the Baptist, it says leaps, moves in her womb, and suddenly all four, the two babies and the two moms, realize that this is a supernatural event. I read one, one theologian, one commentator said this. He said, at that, at that moment in time, what we come to realize is that, that both of these babies, baby Jesus still in the womb and, and baby John the Baptist still in the womb, who the Scripture says was filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that both of those babies um, were a result of the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I'm not removing um, Zechariah, John the Baptist's um, father. I'm not removing him from the equation. Certainly, he is the biological father of John the Baptist. And in Jesus' case, Joseph is the adoptive father, but not the biological father of, of Jesus. But in both cases, we have, we have babies that are born as a result of the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. We know that because Elizabeth and Zechariah, they'd given up. They said, we're not going to have a child. We're too old for that. But then the, 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 the angel comes and says, yes, you are. And this is a supernatural act of God. What I want us to consider today is Mary, who is, uh, again, seemingly unimportant, insignificant. No one knows her name. She's, she's poor. She just just doing what poor young ladies do at one moment. And then the next, in the next moment, actually it took some time, but generations passed, and she is now considered blessed and, 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 and esteemed and, and, and even revered. And some might even say worshipped and prayed to. And so I think the question that's begged um, is, like, is that even appropriate? And why, why is that? How, did that? how did that happen? How did she go from being completely insignificant to ultimately significant? I was talking with a friend this week, and we were talking about a church, a uh, Catholic church here in the valley, and, and its, its name is... Uh, is, I want to get this right, this Our Lady, Queen of the Universe, Catholic Church. And that is a solid name. I mean, you know, we can deal with the theology of that later, but, but like, man, it's hard to beat that name, right? Like, to, you give me, not right now, but somebody come up to me later and give me a better name or a more extravagant name for a church than that. Our Lady, Queen of the Universe, Catholic Church. Drop the mic, right? So what, what, is, what is the significance of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus? Okay, let us now read the Magnificat. This, this is sung or, or, or cried aloud by Mary at the moment in which John the Baptist leaps or turns over or whatever in Elizabeth, the relative's womb, and, and Mary realizes, like, 
this is of the Lord. There's, there's something going on here. And we, we, she goes from being a scared, young, anonymous girl to being a, a prophet. To, to being someone whose words will now be recorded forever in Scripture at that moment in time. And here's what she says. Luke chapter 1, it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. I'm only going to stop once. Magnify, magnificat. The Lord, who is she, ta- who is she talking about? She is speaking of the Messiah in her womb. All right, now I'm going to read without stopping. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, you see why I have have said that, that Mary at this moment goes from being a scared little girl to being a prophet, to speaking prophetically the words that are then recorded in Scripture, because these, uh, some of this has taken place already, some of this is yet to happen, but she speaks with confidence prophetically. Here is what our Lord and Savior has done, is doing, will do. She is thrilled. Mary rejoices in her Savior. She says, in God my Savior. And, and why is she so thrilled? Well, there are four. We're not going to project these. You can write them down if you want or type them into your phone. But there are four reasons why Mary is thrilled. She, she gives, those, gives us those reasons. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And then she says, four, not for the number, but for this is the for, for this reason and for this reason and for this reason and for this reason, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She gives us four reasons. Number one, she says, because Jesus took notice of my humble condition. She says, Jesus took took notice of my humble condition. By the world's standards, Mary held a very lowly, humble position in life. What she really had to look forward to is she was betrothed, and this poor carpenter, who is no doubt somewhat older than her, this poor carpenter named Joseph, would one day marry her, take her into his home. They would have uh, some kids, they would scrape out a meager existence, and there's a, that's, that's, a, that's a good life. That's what she had to look forward to, because by the world's standards, she was very lowly 
and humble. That was her position in life, and that was the position of her future husband. But what she takes or what she celebrates is that, 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 that while she thought that, that her children would share in this lowly estate, and no doubt Jesus did for a time share in that lowly estate. I mean, he was born in a manger. His parents are poor. But, but what she celebrates is that that is my life. That's that on this earth that is, but 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 Jesus has taken notice. And Jesus, he will esteem me. And I now want to look at that Luke chapter one encounter with the angel Gabriel that I, I spoke of earlier. We're 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 going back in time a little further now. Let's just remember what the angel Gabriel said. If we could put that up. This is this is what happened. This is Days ago, weeks ago, months ago, before her encounter was with Elizabeth, it, it says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And I just have to believe that, that for a moment, for a moment, when, when Mary was just hoping to, to get married to a poor guy and have a meager existence and have a few kids or a lot of kids or whatever, that, that I have to believe that for a moment when she heard Gabriel's words, she said, favored one? I, I'm not even married. I'm a young teenage gal. I, I'm a virgin. And you're, you're saying that that I, I'm now going to be pregnant and, and I'm going to be made fun of in my community and Joseph might not even marry me. Favored one? You call this favor? But you see how ultimately this does work out and ultimately she is favored one. And here's my point in your life. I've said this in months past in a sermon. Someone reminded me just the other day. I said, you, your position in Christ, your position in Christ as a Christ follower, as a person who has submitted your life to Christ, you are not just forgiven, you are favored. You're favored. It may not seem like it right now. You, you may say, uh, you call this the Lord's favor? But in your life, like in Mary's life, for eternity, you are an adopted child of the living God. You are favored. She says, I, I, I magnify, I celebrate, I rejoice because, number one, my Savior, He has taken notice of my humble position. He has favored me. And she gives a second reason why she magnifies God, her Savior. And that is, number two, all generations in the future, she says, all the generations, all generations in the future will revere me. You know, and, and as, as, as Protestants, sometimes we can get really uncomfortable. I totally get it. That's another sermon, another day. I, like, maybe we revere Mary a little too much, right? But, but here, here is, here's a fact. She spoke those prophetic words on that day, and that came to be. She said, I rejoice in God my Savior because from now on all generations in the future will revere me. She says in verse 48, he has looked on the, hum on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. And how does she know this on that day? I mean, she's, she, she, she hasn't even give birth, given birth to the Christ child yet. The, the, uh, the magi or the, 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 the royalty from the east, they've not come, come yet to give her uh, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the, 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 the shepherds have not yet come from, from, from the fields to see the, the baby. Uh, 
Herod has not yet chased her and, and Joseph into Egypt in an attempt to kill this king of the Jews. Uh, how does she know at this point that all generations in the future will revere me? Well, she, know this. she knows this because God has told her. Like all prophetic utterances, it came from the Lord. But let's be clear. Mary's blessedness, her, her favor, her, her, the, the reverence, it, it, it's not based on her own piety, her own good works, her own years of dedicated service to the Lord. Her, her blessedness is simply because God chose to be good to her. God chose to favor her. The introduction of Mary, verses earlier that we just read, this greeting from angel, greetings, O favored one. They, 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 they settled into her soul, and she must have thought, like, like maybe you're thinking right now, Pastor Randy says I'm favored. How, how am I favored? When she heard those words that day from, from the angel Gabriel, they, it must have taken a, a, an amount of time for it to settle into her soul and for ultimately to believe, yes, I'm favored. She gives a third reason why she magnifies God, her Savior, why she's so thrilled. She says, number three, he is mighty and he has done great things. Now, what she's doing now is she's starting to transition from the Lord is mighty, he is to be magnified, he is to be rejoiced in because of what he is doing in, in my life, his mother's life, and now she's transitioning. She's about to talk about the nation of Israel and, and ultimately the, the children of God, us, the, 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 the church, universal. And throughout time, she says, he is mighty and has done great things. And I'm going to go straight to number four, the last reason she gives. She says, he is merciful to those who humbly Fear him. He's done great things among his people, she says. In verse 51, she changes. She's talking about herself and in the, in the Lord's blessing in her life. But then in, in verse 51, it's easy, it's easy to see in your, in, in your uh, translation of the Bible. She changes pronouns to third person plural. And she starts talking about how, how God, what he does for his humble, believing children not just for Mary, not just for Joseph, but what Jesus is doing and will do in the lives of his humble, believing children. It says he, he, he's going to scatter the proud. And they're going to go away hungry. But he's going to exalt the lowly and the humble. If, if that's you today, if you maybe have never celebrated before the fact that you're lowly and humble and poor, picked upon. But, but, but this is a passage of rejoicing for you because Mary, prophetically, she says, Jesus, he's going to exalt the lowly. He's going to exalt the humble. They, they will be satisfied with good things. And then she says, third, he, uh, Jesus, he is going to make good on all the promises that God has made to Abraham and to Israel. So now if we can tighten our focus just a little bit more, I want to talk about three themes in this passage. Three themes in this passage. Theme number one is this. It's a theme of Reversal. I, 
I, I want to be clear that, that this, this idea of rich, poor, this contrast of rich, poor, it's, it's not primarily a socio-political sort of a sort of a thought or a mindset but it's 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 rather the the, the humble poor and the the rich proud the humble poor the rich proud we'll we'll unpack that further theme of reversal number 1 this theme of rehearsal means that the humble are exalted the humble are exalted the, the, the proud are laid low you see, in Jesus coming, and if you didn't get the memo on this, this is vitally important. If you, if, if you haven't heard anything else, if you're, not, if you're tuned out, you need to tune back in. This is a very important point in Mary's prophetic utterance in her Magnificat. In Jesus coming, in His birth, in His moving into our neighborhood, moving into um, our, our becoming a human being, in Jesus' coming, there is this great reversal in the world's value system. So we want to know that. We want to realize that. And then we, you, I, we, we want to make sure that we're on the, the, the right side of this equation because, again, there is this great reversal in the world's value system. In which Mary says, look, all of us who are humble and picked upon and, and lowly and anonymous, it's going to be that way for a little longer. She says, but ultimately Jesus, he is ushering in a new system. This great reversal of systems. It reminds me of when Jesus says, to his apostles regarding the rich young ruler. He, when he says, yeah, yeah, it's, it is impossible, Jesus says, for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, is he saying that literally? And I'm going to tell you, no. He is not literally saying that it is impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. He is not saying that. Some of his closest disciples were rich women who were able to fund the ministry of the disciples. When, when, when Peter and Paul would go on their great missionary journeys, those journeys were often funded by rich people. John Mark's mother was probably a rich person with a large house and a church with, was birthed in her house because she was a woman of means. So why, why do I bring up this story? Jesus says to, to, the, to the apostles, the, the rich young ruler walks away and he says, it, it is impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Is he, is he saying that literally? No. What he is doing, he is doing the same thing that his mom did 30 years earlier. He is, again, making reference to the fact that he has come to reverse roles and to usher in a new kingdom that is in opposition to the world's current value system. So, in other words, if you, and every one of us in this room, we are by the world's standard. If you are rich and you are living for your riches, that is what mostly motivates you, and you mostly want to keep your stuff, and you mostly want to buy a boat, and you mostly want to, to, to hold on to your stuff. You want to, remember that old saying that years ago, I, I, you, you, you get all you can, you can, can all you get, and then you sit on the lid, right? If, if that's how you, I mean, that sounds funny, or maybe you're totally lost by what I just said, but if that sounds funny to you, like, yeah, just hoard all your goods and keep all your goods, and, and I'm not going to give it to anybody, I'm not going to give it to the church, I'm not going to give it to the poor, right? like, if that's you, then, then woe to you. That's the, Jesus says, it is impossible for the rich person to make it into heaven, 
Because Jesus says there's this reversal of the systems now where you no longer live for the stuff of the earth, but you now live for the kingdom of God. It is, it is a reversal So if you're living under the current value system of the world, then Jesus would say, woe to you. He said it in the Beatitudes. Luke chapter 6, I think we have that. It says, this is Jesus, you know, as an adult. Now talk, blessed are, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Not because you're a jerk, but, but if they revile you because you follow Jesus, he says, blessed are you. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you. To you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. There is this reversal that Jesus ushers in. And it's true to this day. And we must be careful on what side of this equation are we living. Are you living according to the, the world's value system? Or have you realized, have you taken notice that Jesus has ushered in a new system? Are you living in that system? So by way of summary, we have, we have at least three reversals that, 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 that Mary is celebrating this theme of reversal that we have a moral reversal, a new way of, of doing life. We have a, a social reversal, a, a new way of relating to one another, and a spiritual reversal, a new way of relating to God. The theme of reversal, the second theme is this, the theme the theme. Mary celebrates this theme of the fulfillment of promises. God is keeping his covenant promise to Abraham by sending the Messiah into the world. What is the covenant to promise? We're not going to project it, but let me just read from Genesis chapter 12. This is what, this is what God told, uh, told Abraham in prehistory, long time ago, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. God says to Ab uh, chapter 12, Genesis uh, verses 1, 2, and 3, Now the Lord, now the Lord said to Abram, he hadn't even changed his name yet. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And here's where we land. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So ultimately, is the Abrahamic covenant, hey, Abraham, when people pick on you, I'm going to kill them. And when they bless you, I'm going to bless them. I mean, that is not, that is not the, the, the most significant aspect of this covenant that God makes with Abraham. What's the, the pinnacle the high point, the high watermark is when, when God says to Abraham, in you, in your seed, in your lineage, in your, through your family, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What is he talking about? Way back there in Genesis 12, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the coming of the Messiah. 
such that, that all Jews and Gentiles might be folded in, grafted in to the church universal, the family of God. And so Mary celebrates this theme, the fulfillment of the promises that God has made in this Abrahamic covenant. In 2 Corinthians 5, it's spoken in another way. That it's, it, it refers to, G, uh, to, to Jesus as a reconciler. He takes brokenness and he fractured relationships and he brings us together. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You are called to be a, a reconciler, not a fighter, not a divider, but a reconciler. Verse 19, that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when Mary, when Mary says in the Magnificat, when she says, verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. She's talking about all this, this, this ancient stuff about Abraham. What she's talking about is God is now making good on his promises. He is sending the great reconciler. The great, the, the great reconciler is in my womb. God is fulfilling his promises, which leads to our last theme out of um, Mary's Magnificat, and that is this, the, th the theme of superiority of Christ, the Christ child over all other human beings ever born. That's a, that's a mouthful. The theme of the superiority of the Christ child over all other humans ever born. Jesus, he is like us, yes, but he is uniquely God. He is the God-man. In fact, in verse 43, we, we haven't read this today. This is earlier. Remember the story I told you about Elizabeth? Um, she, Mary comes to visit. They're relatives. They're, they're both with child. Uh, Elizabeth has John the Baptist Mary has Jesus, and John the Baptist leaps in the womb because he realizes his second cousin, whatever, is, is the Messiah, and all this uh, supernatural stuff is going on. And then in verse 43, I think we have it, Elizabeth says to Mary, Elizabeth says, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to visit me? What's going on there is even Elizabeth realizes you're carrying the Messiah. She says, the mother of my Lord, you, Mary, you are carrying my Lord and Savior, the Messiah, in your womb. And Mary celebrates that. This isn't like anything else. This baby is like none else. This baby is superior in every way. The Christ child is superior over all other humans ever born. So, in, um, as we wrap this up today, what, what do we do with this? I mean, it's cool. I mean, I've, I've had a good time this week just reading and studying this passage, but, but what do we do? I've got... Um, I got four statements. I'm just going to make them, and then we're going to pray. And we're going to we're going to run to the table of communion, seeking God's mercy and grace. So, what do we do with this message? I, I've written down four sentences. Number one, Luke. This is just a this is just a quote from Luke. Have certainty regarding the things that you have been taught. 
I mean, some of the stuff that I've said today, it's like well, I learned that in Sunday school back in the 70s, you know, or I, I read it in a storybook or hopefully you read it in the Bible. Um, and Luke, Luke, in early in chapter 1, when he writes the Gospel of Luke, he writes it to a guy named Theophilus, and he says, I'm writing these things so that you may have certainty regarding the things you have been taught. And I, what I want to encourage you today, number one, your response is just, just, just rest in the truthfulness of this story. Rest in the certainty regarding the things you've been taught. Number two, live according to this new king and this new kingdom that has been ushered in. Number three, rest in God's promises. Rest in them. Know that, that, that He does favor you, that He is working on your behalf, that He is good, and that He does good. Celebrate that the way the kids are celebrating whatever they're celebrating in the next, on the other side of the wall right now. Celebrate like that. Rest in the promises of God. And the last one, it, it's really all, through, all four of these are really quite similar. The last one is, the, is, is maybe the most heavyweight. And it's just a review of what I've already said, and that is make, make absolutely sure, make, make doubly sure that you have aligned your life and your, your way of life and your your vision and values for life. Make, make sure that you have aligned that with the new kingdom and the new king that has been ushered in. Make sure that all that you are about, the direction that you're heading in life, the vision and values that, have, that, he, that you have chosen to, to live for, the things that you say, I will die for that, everything else insignificant, I will die for that. Make sure, absolutely sure, that you have aligned yourself with this new king, Jesus Christ, and this new kingdom that he has ushered in. That is the, that is the eternal decision that you will make. Let's pray. God, we come to you today celebrating this, this beautiful story. It's just, it's, it's encouraging, motivating, it's fun. It's, it, it, it's, it makes us happy to remind ourselves once again that yeah, we, we believe this. This isn't just some storybook thing. This is like reality. God, we want to align ourselves. This, this Christmas season, we want to align our, our vision and values with this new kingdom that you've ushered in, this new system. We want to get this right. We don't want to, we don't want to miss this. I'm going to give you, my friends here sitting here in the room today, I'm going to give you a moment of silence to, to pray, not out loud, but a moment of silence where you might just say, God, I've veered off to the right or I've veered off to the left with, with, with how I've purposed my life, where I'm headed in life, but I want to I I align myself with this, with this king and this kingdom. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live in, according to his new system that he has ushered in. If that's you, just take a moment in this silence and just, just make that Make that your prayer, your heart's cry to God.